Welcome to the Thriving Farmer Podcast. I'm your host, Michael Kilpatrick. Our mission is to inspire, educate, and celebrate sustainable farming. We believe that you can build a profitable, sustainable farm that gives you true farm freedom. Join us as we talk to farmers, innovators, educators, and entrepreneurs to glean their top takeaways in business and life. Hey, Thriving Farmers, Michael here. Today's episode is with Josh Volk. Now, Josh is a veteran of the small scale farming community. Um, he's been around it for about 20 years, first started managing others' farms and then started his own farm, Slow Hand Farm, about 10 years ago. And that's been many different iterations. And we talk about that in the episode. Now, a couple big topics that we cover in this episode. First is small scale farms and uh, what makes them work. So we talk through starting farms. We talk through the ergonomics of farms and tools. We talk through labor. Uh, We even have a good conversation about CSA and just in general, the importance of urban agriculture. So Josh is a a very well-read person and um, it's always a pleasure to get him on and, and chat with him. And I was actually able to spend some time with him earlier this year when I was out in uh, the Portland area working with one of our small farm U university members. And so we had to have dinner together and, and got to discuss in detail farm finance, which, you know, of course, we probably looked at the weirdos in the restaurant, you know, arguing where a farmer's salary should come out or, you know, uh, expensing line items. It was it was a fascinating conversation. We don't quite get into that depth in this episode, but it is still a really good conversation. And as always, join me in welcoming Josh Folk to the podcast. All right, Josh, welcome to the podcast. Thanks. It's uh, great to be here. So give us a little bit of an overview of uh, your background in the the farming space. I got started in farming really because I was uh, interested in eating and I like to eat food and I like to know how things worked. Um, Came from a mechanical engineering background, just, you know, that curiosity about how everything goes together. And it was the same with food. How does the, you know, how do I make my food? So first it was learning how to cook and then Going from that, I was like, okay, how do I grow the stuff that I that I want to cook? Uh-huh. And the farming piece kind of came also through reading John Jevons' book at the same time. So his book, How to Grow More Vegetables, is really influential. At the same time that I was um, working as an engineer and had a backyard garden and actually shopping at you know for my garden supplies at the Ecology Action store, Bountiful Garden store in Palo Alto. So I was working in Silicon Valley. Wow. And volunteering in a community garden in this very poor neighborhood of East Palo Alto, which had kind of been left behind by the the boom of Silicon Valley. And so I was, through John Jevons, I was kind of seeing the the possibility of really huge production in very small spaces with, I would say, low technology, essentially very sophisticated, low technology, but uh, accessible and really seeing the need for those kinds of things and the community building possibility at at this community garden in uh, East Palo Alto. And so, you know, kind of the combination of all those different things uh, led me to get a lot more interested in, you know, how can I be a part of this? How can I do something that's really positive for the communities that I'm in through food and through growing that food. So that's what started me on the whole thing. Mm. And since then, you've had a number of different farming kind of seasons because you've worked for a number of different farms and set up a couple along along the way. Yeah. So I've been doing this for about, uh, well, a little over 20 years, 22, 23 years, something like that. And I would say, you know, the first part of that was kind of this, this piece that I was, you know, just talking about with John Jevons getting inspired by him and the community gardens and really thinking that I was going to do an urban agriculture project um, using these small hand scale methods. And then this guy, Jack Smith, who had an an organization called the Urban Agriculture Network that was based out of DC. I just happened to come across his name and uh, have a meeting with him. And he encouraged me to go and learn farming from farmers. Uh And so I spent maybe about a decade going and learning on other people's operations, but on a little bit larger scale. So more in the 5, 10, 15 acre range, Uh um, diversified vegetables, um, and kind of being immersed in that. And, you know, started out as an apprentice and worked my way into management jobs, essentially, 
And those are really fantastic opportunities to, to, you know, learn within the context of somebody's system that had already been set up from some people that already had quite a bit of experience, but also, you know, over time, more and more opportunity to try my own things. And I always knew that I wanted to get back to the smaller scale. So after about a decade of doing that, I left the the farm that I'd been at for quite a while and started my own thing. But that wasn't a direct path. So I wasn't quite sure exactly what I wanted my own thing to be right away. And I didn't feel like I had had the opportunity just the time while I was farming full time to think through that clearly. So when I left that farm, I had the opportunity to do some part-time work with a number of different operations, kind of getting them up and going or just offering help. And and I really connected with that part-time thing. So I've been doing my own part-time thing ever since then, along with helping other folks' farms. I could get more specific on some of those if you want me to give some examples. Yeah, because I remember you did a a pretty big project a couple of years ago, helped set a project up, and you've been out on the island as well working, so... Yeah, so Sabi Island, I think, might be the island. I've worked on a few islands. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but Sabi Island might be the, the place that you're thinking of. And we have some mutual friends that have worked there. And uh, that was actually my last job. So I worked at Sabi, a farm called Sabi Island Organics for seven years as mostly the field manager. Uh, I had a couple different titles over that time, but I started out as a field manager. Mm-hmm. And when I stepped into that job, that was kind of, that was the first real management job that I had on Uh a farm. And I had been uh, working on farms for about three seasons at that point. And so kind of coming into my fourth season, I got handed a little bit more responsibility to set up really, I mean, the farm was established, it was going, but it was at this stage where they wanted to make the step up from doing the tillage with the tractor, but not doing, but doing all the cultivation by hand Mm -hmm. um, to uh, having a cultivating tractor and kind of getting more systems in place. And so they had already bought a cultivating tractor, but I set up the cultivating tractor systems for them over the course of those seven years. And, and we did expand a bit. We moved the farm. I had the opportunity to set up an, an entirely new spot. Um, and I helped design, uh, brought a planning system that I had been developing and, and really honed that there. Very spreadsheet heavy. They had already been using spreadsheets, but kind of in a, in a little bit rougher form. Uh-huh. And got to work with a fantastic team of folks. The owner, Sherry, um, put a lot of trust in the management team and the crew and really stepped back and let us do some amazing things while we were there. We developed apprentice programs that I think I think were really fantastic. And then that farm was wanting to expand even more. So we were up to about nine acres by the time I left, and they were wanting to expand more at that point. And I knew that I wanted to get back to a smaller scale. <clears throat> so that's uh-huh. why I ended up leaving there. And then I also worked, I mean, just on the island uh, thing, I also worked out on, I had the opportunity to work very briefly with a guy who was setting up a homestead out in Hawaii on the Big Island. That was pretty fascinating. That was just after I was at Salve Island Organics. That was really interesting just to see like how different the growing conditions could possibly be. Uh Totally, totally different climate, um, soil type, all of that. And then the the third island, just to to make it complete, the third island, I've done a little bit of work with a friend of mine, Michael Abelman, up in Salt Spring Island. And he was, he was certainly been a, a huge mentor for me and um, worked on some great projects with him. And he's got a really beautiful farm up there on in Salt Spring Island, Fox Club Farm. Yeah, you've definitely had some fun projects along the way. And and that's the kind of cool thing is that a lot of farmers get in uh, doing farming and they get onto one farm and they really work that farm for a long time, which is great. But I think the other cool part is doing so many different projects, you get to see things from so many different angles. And it gives you kind of a broader uh, scope of the industry. Now, you actually took that and uh, put that in a book form. Yeah. I mean, I think in some ways it's a little bit of a unique experience. I'm sure there's lots of other folks that have had that same experience of hopping around from farm to farm. And certainly the people that you hear from more, you know, are on one farm for longer periods of time and kind of write about that single farm model. So, you know, a little bit in reaction to that, you know, uh, Jam's book, which I thought was excellent, um, and that kind of built on uh, Elliot Coleman's work, I think, um, Uh was a really nice homage in some ways to to Elliot's work. 
those books were very much about, you know, kind of single system. This is one farm. Uh This is a, you know, how to do it. And, and so I wanted to write something different, which was, there's lots and lots of different ways that people make this work. It's not just one way. Uh And there's lots and lots of people that have been doing it. Another thing that I see all the time is, and I was the same way, I think, when you first get into it, you don't know what you don't know and you don't Uh know all the things that are out there. So you get exposed to one or two things and you kind of feel like that's the universe. Yeah. And you think, oh, there's this one way that somebody's making it work and they've figured out something that nobody else knows. And as you get further and further into it, you start to realize, oh, they do know something, but it's based on all of these other people that are out there also and all the experiences and it didn't just spontaneously generate. And there's lots and lots of different models that all work. So they're showing one of the models that works and they're really sold on their model. And there are reasons why for them and their particular circumstances that has worked really well. Uh Um, But that doesn't necessarily mean that it's going to translate perfectly to what you are trying to accomplish. And so I wanted to bring a book in, which is saying, here's lots of different ideas from you, you know, think about what the possibilities are and how you know different models might line up with what you're trying to do um, and go out and look for yourself because there's, you know, I showed 15 different farms in the book that I wrote, Compact Farms, but there's so many more farms out there that are really good examples and that are making it work really well. Yeah, because it all comes back to the context and you kind of mentioned that a little bit when you talked about going to Hawaii and seeing how just different that was. And I mean, you look at things like precipitation and soil and the, the frost-free days and the, the, you get hurricanes or tornadoes or the bug and disease pressure in the South. So there's not one right way to grow a carrot. Yeah, and that's one layer of it. And there are so many layers of it, you know, just to kind of peel back because uh-huh. it's, the, it's the climate, you know, it's the geography, all of that. But it's also the, you know, the local food culture in the market Uh because you're trying to do this, you know, not just for yourself. So, you know, how developed are the markets where you are and which markets are are better developed and, you know, what's the food that people eat where you are. And that's a piece. And then every farmer has an individual personality. So, and maybe the farm's not just one person, maybe it's multiple people. Uh And so it's a different set of personalities. And so some people just work differently, have different priorities, have different ideas of what work ethic means and more layers on top of that. But, you know, those are some of the layers that I tried to bring out in the book, um, that it's not just this one thing of how do I produce something where I am. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I think one of the other things you put in there, because of the different farmers, you have the different builds of the farmers. And that's one of the things you've done with the tools you've worked on is try to build and try to think about tools in relationship to how a farmer's actual body is put together. Sure. Um, Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, the ergonomic side of it. So, um, do you want to kind of talk a little bit about the tools you've been working on as well? Yeah, well, I just mentioned, you know, that I talked about my my background being mechanical engineering and me just being somebody who likes to tinker with things to figure out how they work and to figure out ways to make them work better. I started out, I mean, before I went to mechanical engineering school, I was a bicycle mechanic. So, you know, kind of that technology of the bicycle, which is very much a human powered technology, is you know, deep inside me because I worked for so many years on the bikes and I know those bits and parts. And so, you know, building on that, going to engineering school, I did take some classes on ergonomics or or at least one class on ergonomics while I was there and classes on uh, basic machine design. And then building on those those principles coming into the farm, you know, kind of looking at uh, what are the really simple tools and, and everything, of course, is building on something that came before. Uh So one of the tools that I developed that I've kind of probably put more uh, energy into than any other tool has been this farm cart. And that is just an evolution of the garden cart. So we had garden carts on the uh, kind of Vermont cart, garden cart uh, on the farm for years. And those things are amazing in terms of the simplicity of their design and how tough they are and Uh um, how much they will haul and how much abuse they'll take. But eventually they do start to fall apart. And we had a cart that had come apart, but I salvaged the wheels. And I had an idea for, I always wanted it to be able to straddle a bed. We were on four foot centers and those don't straddle four foot centers. And additionally, when you pick them up, everything tends to slide to the back. And Uh 
You can't go over a raised bed at all because they'll drag, certainly not with any crops in it. So there were just a bunch of different things that I wanted to update on that cart for our particular situation where it would straddle that four feet, where it would have some extra clearance, where I didn't have to bend over to pick up the handle, where people didn't have to um, lean awkwardly in order to put the load into the bed of the cart. Uh Um, And so, you know, I was combining bicycle technology where I eventually um, was using bicycle wheels, which are a little bit more commonly available than the cart wheels, although they're very similar and, and more commonly available now. And I was, uh, you know, basic steel tubing, really simple frame. Um, and then a lot of the ergonomics, you know, just really, really simple concepts and ergonomics of uh, body position when you're using it and uh, how you're interacting with the tool um, in all of the different operations that you're doing around the tool, applying those to that farm cart. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and I've seen multiple iterations out in your neck of the woods because you worked with so many different farmers around there building them. Um, but now your latest, isn't that a one wheel that's actually motorized? Yeah, so that may not be the latest one, but I built them and offered them for sale for, I've done that a couple of different times. And uh, one of the farmers in the area uh, asked me, actually, um, the two wheel one is great for straddling beds and running over top of crops and doing that kind of thing, but it's very wide. And they wanted to go um, with a single wheel version. So I just modified the, the existing parts to create a single wheel version, which is more similar to a, a wheelbarrow in some ways, although the, the balance is different. It's a little bit more balanced uh, in terms of moving the load around. And it's a little bit less balanced in some ways when you put it down. So you have to be careful about that. That single wheel version that I developed it happened to be the only cart that I had on hand when I had a project that I wanted to do with uh, OSU engineering students. So Oregon mm-hmm. State University uh, Engineering School, I had connected with them and their engineering students need to do a capstone project and they work with companies in the area uh, that use engineers to basically feed projects to these students for their capstones. And so I'm not a typical size company for that. I mean, I'm hardly a company at all, but the students were interested in working on something applicable for small farms. And uh, I connected them with some other resources and said, what I really want is to have an electric assist on here. So I had used an electric assist on a, on a delivery bicycle for a number uh-huh. of years and really got sold on that concept of kind of uh, augmenting the human power. And they ended up designing kind of a controller or basically programming a controller that went with a standard bicycle hub motor so that there's a little trigger on the handle of the cart and you can add power to that wheel as you're rolling. So if you're going uphill, basically, or if you have a super heavy load, especially in bumpy terrain, it helps to have that wheel driving a little bit as you're trying to push the cart along at the same time. So in that sense, you more steer it and the wheel is actually what's moving it. Very cool. And you've also done some work with post-harvest stands and stuff, which I found particularly interesting. Yeah, we spend more time on the farm probably in the wash pack station than any other specific spot on the farm. And so that, you know, that's a kind of low hanging fruit for making really simple ergonomic improvements and also just flow. I mean, ergonomics is really the, the optimization of worker efficiency. So uh-huh. when I say ergonomics, I'm thinking about people's health and, and uh, well-being, but I'm also thinking about how quickly somebody can, get it, can accomplish a job and how effectively they can accomplish that job inside that word. So there are you know, lots of little ergonomic things um, to create a wash pack system and the, the, what I call the furniture for that wash mm-hmm. pack area that really makes sense for the methods that I have and in that small space. So, Yeah, because I think a lot of, especially new farmers don't realize is just a three inch difference in the height of a table um, can make a huge difference in how tired you are at the end of a day. Yeah, absolutely huge. And again, Oregon State University, kind of a, their small farms extension program, I, they they actually wrote a grant that paid for a lot of the design work that I did around some ideas in terms of putting really simple uh, packing table together, very simple adjustable heights, uh, sink 
and uh, kind of a prototype for a bin washing system. And then I've put all of that up on on websites. Uh, I think that that information, it got corrupted at one point by a hacker. Um, I'm, I think that I have it back up, but I'm not 100% certain I should go back and, mm. and check that. But those idea, you know, kind of incorporating a lot of the ideas around, you know, like you're saying, making the height perfect for the working height for what somebody is doing is really, really important if somebody is going to be standing somewhere and doing something for more than a few minutes. And it's not that hard a thing to do. Um, another thing that's not in that project that I think about all the time is appropriate lighting makes a big, big difference. Oh, yeah. And that's something I see folks not concentrating at all on. You know, b- barns tend to be really dark, dim spaces, and mm-hmm. eye strain over time is a problem. Not to mention, you just are not able to see as much and to do the quality assessment that you should be doing if you don't have appropriate lighting. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. So there's lots of lots of these really small things that we can do, putting things on wheels. <laughs> oh yeah. So that you know, with that packing table, that packing table is on wheels so that you can move the packing table to the place where you want to pack. Or if you need to go get supplies, you don't have to bring those over separate. You can just move the table to where the supplies are, load it up with the supplies and then move the the whole table back. So the wheel is another, you know, great invention. You don't have to carry stuff. uh, Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's just one of those great inventions out there. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we take for granted so often. So let's talk, now you're on a very small scale farm that's actually in downtown, or I guess you'd call it downtown? Not downtown. No, it's in one of the residential neighborhoods. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. One of the residential neighborhoods. And you're doing that part-time and also working in your house part-time. But you recently also did a, another book, a, a chapter for another book that you've been working on, correct? Yeah, yeah. So again, uh, Oregon State University, um, who has been fantastic. It's been really interesting to see that evolution. So I've been in Oregon now for almost 20 years. And about uh, 18, 19 years ago, when the USDA took over the, the term organic, that was basically the point where the state universities and Oregon State University in particular kind of started to step up and say, oh, we need to pay attention to these small organic farms. And it hasn't been, you know, completely smooth the whole time. But in the beginning, it was pretty rocky, the relationship. But Oregon State University has had a great relationship for, I would say, the last decade plus with the small farms in the area. And I've had the opportunity to work with them quite a bit. And my partner actually works with them. And so the Oregon Small Farms Program worked with Story to put together a book based on this curriculum, this training curriculum that they had developed for their small farms program for not totally entry-level farmers, but kind of that next step where maybe you have two or three years, but you want to start to get a little bit more refined. Mm. And and so they took that curriculum and put it into a book. And Tanya Murray and I uh, wrote the chapter called Management, which is uh, manage it is basically around kind of the financial piece. Uh-huh. Um, so how, and uh, you know tracking income and expenses, and then uh, using that information for making decisions about uh, how the farm should go go forward. Yeah, and that led to a very interesting discussion at dinner when I was out there earlier this summer. Yeah, yeah. So prior to that, I mean, for a number of years now, basically, I started Slowhand Farm. So Slowhand Farm is kind of my the name that I use. So the farm that I'm farming on right now is Cully Neighborhood Farm, and I basically say that that's managed by Slowhand Farm. Uh-huh. Um, so Cully Neighborhood Farm is my part time, you know, kind of hands on in the dirt project. And then Slowhand Farm is, you know, kind of the the catch-all for everything that I do. But initially, Slowhand Farm was my production farm, and so that was 2009. I think was the first year of that farm. And so going back to 2009, pretty much every year since then that I've been farming, uh, that I've been running a farm, I've written up this number, and it is kind of the best way that I could think to compare from year to year that would be scale independent. Mm. So as the farm scaled up, it wouldn't get distorted. And also, if I wanted to compare to somebody else's operation, this was kind of the best way that I felt like maybe I could 
make some type of comparison with a single number. What I've realized over time is that a single number, I mean, there, there's no way you're ever going to make a single number make mm-hmm. a good comparison. And there's so much more to comparing farms that it's really tough. But I see people out there using all kinds of other proxies like, oh, gross per acre. But gross per acre doesn't take into account how much the people on the farm are actually making. Mm-hmm. Um, or you could say, well, what's the farm netting? You know, what, how much is the farm? But there's so many different ways to report net that that becomes really problematic. And the other thing is, even if the farmer themselves, the person who owns the farm is making quite a bit of money, that's not saying anything about the employees on the farm, the people who are doing the work on the farm. Mm-hmm. Um, so I wanted to kind of adjust for that. So the number that I came up with is I take the gross income from the farm, so all the revenue for the year, and then I subtract from that all of the non-labor expenses. So I take out anything that I'm paying in salary or benefits to employees on the farm, anything that I'm paying myself out of the farm, um, and I just do the non-labor. And then I'm good about tracking my own and, of course, all of my employees, which are hourly. I track all of their labor hours. So I have a total number of hours that were worked on the farm, out in the field, in the office, you know, doing the marketing, um, all of that. And I divide that by the balance. And so that gives me a dollars per hour worked generated by the farm. Mm-hmm. And it's it's the average across everybody on the farm. So unless unless I'm not making minimum wage, <laughs> if somebody's making a minimum wage, it's it's going to be above minimum wage, basically. Mm-hmm. And it's going to be more than the person who's the lowest paid person on the farm. And it's going to be less than the person who's the highest paid person. Um, but it's going to, you know, basically balance out, you know, if those low paid people are only working a few hours and the higher paid people are working a lot more hours, then it's not just like I'm averaging, well, the average wage on the farm is this much. So basically what it's doing is looking at how much is produced monetarily per labor hour. Yeah, per all of the labor hours. Exactly. You know, what's the what's the net per labor hour? And it's a little bit, you know, as you get into any of these numbers, when you're figuring out what are those expenses to subtract, the gross is pretty straightforward. Gross is a really easy number. And that's probably why a lot of people use gross as the easy number. Expenses get a little bit trickier to report evenly because you start to get into these areas where it's like, well, did I really, you know, I expensed this tool that I bought, but did I really need to buy that tool? So Uh should that really come out of the expenses for that year? And then also, you know, maybe if it's a really big purchase, am I going to take all those expenses out in one year? And so my one year is going to look terrible and my other years are going to look really great because I'm not buying that tool repeatedly. That's generally, you know, depreciation is used for in some sense, but it can get a little bit, uh, a little bit fuzzy in terms of what the expense is. But it's an attempt to say, you know, generally what's the net and what's that generating for all the people on the farm? And I'm really interested in not just myself, what can I make on the farm, but how well is this farm supporting all of the people that are working on the farm? So I want to include all of them in that calculation. Mm -hmm. And it also gives you a good idea of just how efficient the business is as a whole, because if it's making a very, very low return, then that's a sign that there's something maybe wrong with your model that you need to start tweaking. If I have different wage rates from year Uh to year, that doesn't have any impact on the comparison from the year to year on that number. And so mm-hmm. that's a nice, another nice thing about that number is it doesn't care whether or not I've upped everybody's uh, wage rate because it's just reporting across everybody. Mm-hmm. And so it's a really nice comparison in terms of, you know, in some ways in terms of that efficiency from year to year of saying, you know, are we getting better at generating more for the work that we're doing or are we getting worse? <laughs> mm-hmm. And I don't have to worry about, you know, well, is the number just skewed because I was paying people more this year or is the number skewed because I had more people working for me Um, because it's just about labor hours or we worked more hours this year or we worked less hours. Yeah. 
Yeah, because I think we all know that, let's say if you have a greenhouse tomato operation, you may have a huge, massive gross, but you have a tiny net because just the incredible expenses with that crop, you know, the trellising, all that labor, as well as the the heat and that sort of thing and the greenhouse depreciation and all that. So it puts another whole spin on just being able to dial in on these numbers and kind of really see what your operation is doing. Yeah, I think, I think that is a big problem is a lot of people talk about that gross number and that gross number, there's all kinds of expenses that go into that. And it has nothing to do with what you end up with. And similar, but net is so complicated that if you don't average it across all of these labor hours, I, I think it gets too distorted. Yeah. Yeah. Because as you said, that one year big purchase, then the next year looks fabulous because you didn't have that. So making sure you do depreciate the the bigger purchases properly. And um, yeah, even like supplies, because I've seen farmers where they'll buy like one year, multiple pallets of supplies and not use those for several years. And so if you're not knowing when you're using those, those are also going to make your profit look bad. Yep. Yeah. And you know, if you're just thinking about your net in terms of like, what is the farm profiting? You, again, you come back to this question of, well, what are you paying all of the people in order to make that profit? And what are you paying yourself? And do you consider the profit before you pay yourself or do you consider the profit after you pay yourself uh-huh. and how much are you paying yourself? So, you know, at that point, to me, it becomes a fairly meaningless number without yeah. knowing. Yeah, because if you're one business is. type, if you're an LLC, you get an owner's draw. And if, if you're an, an employee, then that comes out before you take the gross profit. And that means to have a different whole rate. Right. So yeah, there's there's a lot of detail in this that you can go into. And so that's why I think your way of putting this is, is really interesting. And I'd be interested, are there any farms that you know of that are have taken this and adopted this and playing around with this? I don't know. I mean, I put it out every year. I was really interested in, and a friend of mine, long, long time farmers, uh, really, really inspiring folks who had a much, much larger operation than I do. Um, were willing to share the numbers with me one year, uh, their numbers. And so I got to look at that calculation. I basically did the calculation for them. So they just shared the numbers with me and then I did the calculation. And it was really interesting to me because they came out very similarly to Mm. what I came out at. So if you looked at any other of the measures, you know, I mean, of course they're gross because they were doing many more acres than I was doing by several factors was enormous compared to my gross. And even if you looked at kind of their individual incomes, their individual incomes were much higher. Uh But if you looked at it across every uh, you know, all the factors and just average it out over all of the labor hours, it was actually a very similar number, uh, you know, dollars per labor hour generated. So it was more in terms of, you know, how many hours were they working mm-hmm. themselves and kind of what was the pay range on the farm, on their farm compared to what was the pay range on, you know, for myself and how many hours was I actually working. So, mm-hmm. Gotcha. And with that, I'd like to stop here and take a quick break. In a minute, we'll be back with Josh Folk from Slow Hand Farm. Hey, Thriving Farmers, Michael here. So I am so excited to share the Thriving Farmers Summit happening this December. Now, we've been spending the last couple of months really working on this, and we have pulled together a amazing group of farmers and educators to speak to you during this summit. And it's virtual, so you can do it from anywhere online. And we've got speakers such as Joel Salatin and Jordan Green and Nick Burton and Ray Tyler and Brian Bates and Charlotte Smith and Erica Tebbins and Ben Falk and a bunch more farmers from all across and educators from all across the industry sharing on things like farm business marketing, innovative crops, and all sorts of things to help you build a thriving farmer business. Now, in addition, we've also lined up an entire panel of farmer case studies. Farmers from all around the world, US, Canada, New Zealand, that are going to be sharing smaller segments of what's working in their business right now. So talking to Carrie from the Looney Farm, Lex and Beth from Ontario, Adam Cohen from Dallas, who's talking about mushrooms, and Audrey, who will talk about farm to school, and Oscar, who will talk about his micro 
microgreen business. And Nick, who's going to come on and talk about how he's using hemp on his vegetable farm. And Brendan, who's gone from zero to 60 with his market garden in the Carolinas. So all sorts of farmers just like you in the trenches working every day on their farm. They're going to be sharing a little case studies of what's working right now in their business. So I encourage you to go to thrivingfarmersummit.com and sign up. The event is 100% free. The live dates are December 6th, 7th, and 8th. So definitely can't wait to share this with you. And I'm um, really looking forward to bring these farmers and educators to share their best top tips for building your farm business, for marketing your products and innovative cropping systems and crops that you can add to your farm in 2020 to make it the best ever and have a thriving farm. So again, go to www.thrivingfarmersummit.com and sign up today. All right, and we are back with Josh from Slow Hand Farm out in Portland, Oregon area. So Josh, let's take it a little bit further here. You have on the current farm that you're working, you have some labor. How do you, how much are you actually, uh, what acreage are you farming there? Yeah, so uh, we're growing on a one acre lot in a residential neighborhood. It's kind of backs up to a, a church property. Um, and then we're surrounded by houses on uh, three sides. We cultivate basically a half an acre worth of space within that one acre lot. So, and then that's going to feed 64, 65, 66 CSA shares per week. Gotcha. And how many full-time equivalents are on that farm? Oh, that is a good question because I don't think of things in full-time equivalents. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I know. Cause all of you are part-time. <laughs> Yeah, so we, we do the farm entirely part-time. Uh, we work Mondays and Thursdays, and everybody works the same days. And then, you know, full-time equivalents, uh, I'm not sure how you would mean that exactly. So I work those two days a week, and I'm pretty much working those two days a week from, I would say, February through November. Okay. And I'm working a little bit in December and January in terms of doing some planning stuff, but I'm not working... In February, March, I'm probably not quite working even eight-hour days yet. Yeah. Um, and similar in November. Um, and in the summertime, I'll, I'll, I'll go up and I'll start working nine, nine and a half hour days. But I'm not, I, I don't push things super, super hard. Uh -huh. And then uh, I have basically one person who's kind of the longest season person with me who works Mondays and Thursdays and uh, is working kind of eight plus hour days, those days. And she started, I'm trying to remember now, I think she started in April and will go through middle of November. Uh -huh. And then another person who started, I think in May and you know, kind of is, is about to finish up uh, here in the next week or so. Um, and then I had a third person who worked with us for about two and a half months, two and a half, three months. Uh, and then occasionally I'll hire, you know, somebody just to, to come in and do a little bit of extra work on a day or, you know, the, the crew will all get together on one of our days off. I think that maybe happened uh, three or four times uh, during uh -huh. the course of the summer. Yeah, we got behind or something. Yeah, and that's actually a really nice thing about this, you know, this model of the part-time farm. And, you know, there's a lot of different reasons why it works in the situation that I'm in and it wouldn't work other places. But is that, you know, putting in a few extra hours uh, on this small a scale uh, isn't that difficult for people who are normally part-time, but it makes a huge difference in terms of how much work we get done in a week. Mm-hmm. Because you're there and you're focused and you know exactly what has to be done by a certain time. Well, we're there, we're focused, but, you know, even a few hours, uh, relatively speaking, you know, three people, two hours, that's six hours of labor. And when we're normally only working two days a week, six hours of labor, that's like almost having an entire another person mm -hmm. yeah. uh, there, right? So, yeah. So for this farm, where are you marketing? Are you just selling the shares to the local community, the people you've developed over the years or... Yeah, so a friend of mine started the the farm, and it's actually one of the farms that's profiled in my book. It was a slightly different model. It's morphed over the years in that profile, but Matt started it, and he had a CSA going when I got there, and that CSA was primarily selling to folks right in the community. So a lot of the people that come and pick up CSA shares from us, everybody comes and picks up on the farm. Okay. Um, and a lot of the people walk or ride their bicycle to come uh, get the shares. 
I don't know what the percentage is exactly, but I would guess it's probably at least half of the people are doing wow. that. And I know that some people are from outside the area, but they are passing through probably on their way home from work, if that's the case, or they maybe only live, you know, one or two neighborhoods over. So, you know, probably most of the stuff is going within five, uh, maybe 10 miles of the farm. Uh, Uh And that's a benefit of being in an urban area, right? And there's tons and tons of population and we're a very, very small farm. So we don't need that many customers in order to be able Uh to support the farm. Let's talk about that a little bit because this morning, actually, on one of the bigger groups, a question popped up about CSAs in general. And my comment was that the original model that was pushed out as what CSAs were is really not as relevant as it was 10, 15, 20 years ago, just because of the rise of the greenwashing of the of the food system. And, um, you know, there's people all over the place on that. But you know, just if you look in your one city there in Portland, how many farms do you think are within an hour and a half of Portland? Oh my God, I, a lot. <laughs> yeah, yeah, because it's one of the most, uh, I would say, foodie cities in the U.S. Yeah, I mean, it, one of the reasons why it's one of the most foodie cities in the U.S. is because of the farms that are uh-huh. in the area. So it's not, you know, it's not like it started out being foodie and then that encouraged all these farms, but it's gone both directions. Uh-huh. We, and you have a great climate too. We're in a great climate. We have really good soils. Um you know, there's a lot of things that feed into that, but it's a great growing area. It's a very fertile area in many senses, really good. And not just vegetables. Um, We're not too far from the coast and we have these major river systems that produce incredible fish and seafood. Mm. It's a really amazing fruit growing area. Also being close to the coast and, and coastal zones are always really excellent pasture areas or frequently are very good pasture areas. And so there's also good dairy. So, you know, there's lots of, and then rangeland uh, on the other side of the state. So, uh, you know, ranching and, and meat mm-hmm. production. So, you know, really, really great access all around. So that, all those things turned into that foodie thing. But to go back to your question about the CSA model, I feel like when this conversation comes up, I understand why people are talking about it. And I understand some of the issues that they're addressing, but I frequently feel like People are missing the point that I see in CSA or the point of CSA that I see. And that is that community supported agriculture is not, in my mind, really intended to be a marketing model. It's intended to be a cultural shift. Uh And that cultural shift being one where the community really is supporting the food production that is supporting them. And that happened, the, the, you know, kind of the proposed model for that or the, the model that, you know, came into the U.S. and kind of was the, laid the groundwork for that term community supported agriculture. So even before it was called community supported agriculture was this particular idea of selling shares up front and gaining that commitment from um, a community group. And having the farmer kind of work in conjunction with that community group to make sure that the production costs were covered and Uh that the community in return was getting the food that was healthy and, and, you know, and going to keep them as a strong, healthy community. In my mind, it doesn't necessarily have to be this one system, but I think that there's a lot of really great things about that model for communities everywhere to Uh look at and say, this is really important. And when it becomes just a marketing tool, it loses, basically, to me, it loses everything that makes it actually CSA, Community Supported Agriculture, and it really just becomes another marketing tool. And so those questions of, you know, essentially does selling shares at the beginning of the season to a group of people who are going to subscribe to that, that system work, that's a little bit different than saying, you know, is this cultural shift um, something that, that we should do and should communities be thinking more about how they're supporting the farms in their area and the, the growers that are growing the food for them. Mm-hmm. Have you done any work in agrihood like development or thinking around that? Um, not really. I mean, I'm aware of them and, and uh, I know of, of some of those projects. You know, I think, it, I think it's a really interesting concept. Um, and I think that for some people, that is a model that works really well. You know, it, you know, going back to kind of the community supported agriculture question in terms of, you know, one of the reactions that people are having is like, well, I can, 
I can make more at the farmer's market and I have that same community connection at the farmer's market. And to me, I, I think that's great. And yeah, farmer's markets weren't in the same place. There weren't the same scale of farmer's markets. They, they weren't as common when CSA was being developed back in the mid 80s. But that doesn't mean that the farmer's market model is exclusive from some of that cultural shift. I mean, I think a lot of things that have happened within the farmer's market sphere actually can line up with that cultural shift quite nicely. Uh huh. Um, so I don't necessarily see them as completely separate. I think that, you know, in there, there's a lot of room within the community supported, con, community supported agriculture concept for unique approaches. But I think for me, keeping in mind that it's not so much a marketing model as kind of this cultural model is really what's important and, and to my thinking about how do I want the farm to function in terms uh-huh. of how do I want the farm to be selling and you know what's the crop mix that I want to be growing. Because the end goal is that more people know about their local food community and tap into that so that the dollars are turning faster locally and that the farmers are not having to feel like they're always trying to market to get the next dollar. I would go even beyond that and say the end goal is to to be in a community that is a really great place to live. <laughs> mm-hmm. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I mean, my wife and I talk about that all the time. We're in a very small community here. I think it's like 5,000 people. Um, the reason we live here is we love the community aspect of it. It's got the walking trails and great parks and the library. The only thing it's missing is a farm. And that's, you know, that's kind of what we're, we're working on right now. It's, uh, it's going to take us a, a while to get that you know, together how we want it. But absolutely, I mean, that to me would be the ultimate community where you could walk out you know, just down your street to the local farm and pick up your food and see that whole community aspect of things. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, and, and again, it's, it's interesting just to see how our community has developed over the years, especially in America. You can look at, let's say, European communities and that sort of thing and how they are different. And now you start seeing development in the U.S. starting to go back toward that. And you know where Eric Schultz is right now is where he's built kind of an agri-hood in this massive neighborhood. I mean, really, if you think about it, where that, ma- that neighborhood that his farm in is in needs 20 of his farms to actually just feed that community. Yeah, you know, a fun, funny thing, kind of going back to something I mentioned earlier, which was uh, running into this guy, Jack Smith, who had the organization Urban Agriculture Network. Um, uh-huh. And uh, it was funny because when I met him and was talking with him, he was the first person I ever heard say anything positive about suburban sprawl uh-huh. and realizing that it, suburban sprawl was not a great thing necessarily in the way that it was happening. But his positive spin on it was that suburban sprawl actually creates a really great density for essentially urban agriculture or an agriculture that feeds the the residents of the community. Uh So there's enough spacing within all the houses that you still have enough open space to grow for the people that are there. Whereas, you know, in a very dense urban environment, you're never going to be able to grow Uh within that same environment, all the food for all the people that are there. Uh-huh. Absolutely. But with, you know, with these suburban developments, yeah, thinking about, you know, how do we develop them? So maybe not 100% of the food, but a large portion of the food can be coming directly from that development itself. I think that I think that's fantastic. Yeah, because one of the things I see here with our kids now that we have a four-year-old and a two and a half-year-old is introducing them to that food. And like every day at lunch, I come up from the I'm at office in my basement. Um, we have some lunch. We go outside. We reserve two beds of the side yard. Um, we have, I think, six beds there. But two beds are for the kids to play in. And, you know, that's part of the daily thing is like we have stuff planted there for them. And they're learning from day one what is farming, you know, where the food comes from. And they're going to have such a different take on being responsible towards the environment than someone who's never seen a farm, only seen the inside of, let's say, a daycare or a school. Yeah, I think that I think that connection to environment, I mean, that, that's one of the reasons why urban agriculture is really important to me. And I think it's really great is that people are able to, even, even if we're only producing a very small portion of the food for the community that we're in, it's an opportunity, it's a meeting place for people to come out and interact in some form with nature in a way that they don't really have that opportunity otherwise. And to get a little bit connected to um, the, the ecosystems 
that exist even in urban environments. So in that in green spaces and uh-huh. um, and all the, and all of those different benefits. Um, so I I think urban planners need to put more thought into that. I mean, parks and green spaces are good, but they don't have quite that same hands on connection that uh, I think urban farms are able to have. The problem with urban farms is they take farmers, whereas the park you just can get someone to mow the lawn. <laughs> <laughs> But those people could those people that are mowing the lawns they could be <laughs> yes oh yeah. yeah well absolutely I agree I'm just you know using why they don't do it is just because it's a lot harder to well try that, to the tr- reason yeah. why they don't do I mean park space is is hard enough to get uh, the land you know when you value land the way that land is valued the it's difficult mm-hmm. to set aside land open space for uh, well, I'll yeah, I'll give an example of when we were starting the community farm in Saratoga. So that was 166 acres was the last remaining farm in Saratoga. And I was able to identify the previous owners. Their lawyer wouldn't take calls from me. So I eventually just found out where they lived and dropped off a, a letter right in the person's mailbox. Um, and they you know, just happened to to call me and we we met and we started working. But the town was so against this whole thing because they just wanted ball fields for recreation. They didn't even want really a park. They just wanted ball fields and more tax base. They wanted to put, you know, houses on that hundred acre field. And it took us up a couple of years and Sandy Arnold, um, which you're definitely familiar with Sandy, yeah. she was the driving force, the the bulldog, as you would say, that kept the vision going forward. <laughs> And, uh, you know, we eventually were able to conserve the entire thing. So it'll never be in houses, but it was just, it was a very interesting, I had never thought that that would be such the, the resistance, but it was because they wanted that tax base. Yeah. And I mean, this goes back to, you know, this all sounds like new stuff, but, you know, like you're saying, there's examples of this all over the country. Uh, you know, going back to another person I mentioned before, Michael Abelman writes a, uh-huh. wrote a great book about his experience, uh, down in Central Coast of California with Fairview Gardens when he was there and, and saving that space that had basically been swallowed up by suburban sprawls. Uh-huh, uh-huh, absolutely. So Josh, you've been in this space for a while. What's the biggest mistake that you see beginning farmers making? You know, I think not doing enough research in hands-on learning for jumping into it. And I don't know that that's always a mistake, but I think that there's a lot more room for going out and learning from other farms uh-huh. um, before starting your own farm. A lot of people recognize, and and that some of that may be an access thing where you know it's really easy to go onto YouTube and to uh, get some of this information from some high profile farmers and to search around and and those guys are encouraging you to start your own thing, and I think that that's not a bad thing necessarily, but it's a little bit less obvious where you can go to apply to work on somebody else's farm and gain hands-on experience before you start your own thing. Uh Um, And, you know, that takes more time also, right? So I'm talking about taking a couple of years, five years before you start your own thing to go and and, uh, and do that hands-on learning and, and learn from somebody else's system. I think the mistake is that people are, you know, trying to take, take these shortcuts and, uh, in a lot of cases, people would be better served if they went and, and uh, became part of a farming community from the inside before starting their own thing. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so you can watch a lot of videos and, and do a lot of courses, but there's nothing that replaces that hands-on aspect. Because I think you know, a lot of people say, well, farming is just another job, but it's not just a job. It's also an artistry. I think there's that aspect of that as a farmer, because you're working with a living soil, hopefully, and because you're dealing with weather, that it's so much more than just something you can learn. You can't just learn it from a book. It has to be learned from your feet in the soil and your hands uh, touching the earth. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, you can you can learn a lot from the books and from the YouTube and uh, you know all that, but you're going to learn so much more from actually doing it. And the, and the great thing about, you know, I, I don't want to put down the courses that people are offering. And, and, you know, I myself put a lot of information out there on the, on the internet and I don't want to short change any of that, but it is a relatively small piece of the learning process. The great thing about it is that it's, it's inspiring people to do that next step uh-huh. and, and get in and do the learning piece. Uh, well, it's inspiring them to get started. And it's inspiring with what's possible. And I think Mm -hmm. that's another thing, like you said at the beginning of the conversation, is so frequently when we start something, we don't know what we don't know. Yeah, absolutely. 
So to that same point with being farmers, is there anything you think that they should avoid that first year that they get started? Again, you don't know what you don't know. So <laughs> <laughs> what you should avoid is something that you don't know that you should avoid. I, I can't think of something, you know, specific, you know, that would be general across every case. Another thing that I see a lot of people, and maybe I'm saying this partly about myself, even after having had experience on other farms for a long time, one of the things that I still find myself having to remind myself of is I'm really excited about the production and figuring out how to grow things more efficiently. Mm -hmm. Um, But that's only a part of having a farm. And Mm -hmm. the sales and marketing piece is really what allows the rest of that, makes the rest of that happen. And so making sure that you can sell and that you are selling at a price that makes sense and that you have enough market out there and enough interest in what you're doing is really something that you have to stay on top of. And so again, I'm probably you know talking to myself as much as anyone, but I do see a lot of folks who are just getting into it, being really excited about trying to figure out how they can make their production systems more efficient. But the thing that really pays is the marketing, not the production systems um, uh-huh. in the end. So yeah. it's, imp- it's important to have those efficiencies, but it's more important if you're going to make money to actually sell something. And so it's more important to make that those sales calls and probably adjust the height of your washing, um, you know, shelf three inches up or down. <laughs> in the in the short term, certainly. Yes. 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 <laughs> in in the beginning. <laughs> <laughs> So, uh, and this is going to be a hard one. If you could pick one, what would be your favorite farming tool? Oh, man. (laughs) Yeah. So uh, everybody uh, probably hates this question, although I I do hear people who answer it pretty easily. um, And I have a million answers for that. Even knowing that it's coming up, you know, I'm still debating what I should say. You know, those farm carts, that's one of my favorite tools, I think, just because I've spent so much time working on them and thinking about them. And, and it really is versatile. So the, you know, I do a lot of things besides just hauling things around with the cart. Um, but being able to haul things around with the cart is, is really helpful. Mm -hmm. Well, what it does is it removes so much of that strain on your back. It it removes a ton of strain on your back. Yeah. And it, and just, I mean, allows you to carry far more than you could ever possibly carry by yourself. Mm -hmm. You can carry hundreds of pounds through the field Whereas, you know, that would take you how many trips back and forth if you were going to just do it with your feet. Yeah. Now that motorized one you've got, how long does that battery last? Well, of course, it depends on how much you're using and and what Mm -hmm. size battery you stick on it and (laughs) all of that. Um, We're not a very hilly site, so I've been using it for a little while and we actually haven't even used the battery in the last year. So I've kind of not been using it myself for a while. But when we were using it, it was lasting. I mean, again, we're only farming, you know, half an acre on an acre plot and without very big hills and without huge loads usually. Um, But it would last us a day or two. Mm. Um, I would guess for a farm that was really taking advantage of it, you would have a couple of batteries and you would just swap them out uh, over the course of the day. And the batteries aren't cheap, but they're not super crazy expensive. Yeah. Yeah. And again, too, it's a lot of, usually on a farm, it's going to be short spurts, like you're going to do your harvesting. So you need it for a couple hours there and then you need to do, you know, move some other stuff. So later in the day, you use it again. So, all right. So Josh, where can people find out more about you and your work? Uh, probably the most centralized place to do that is at the website slowhandfarm.com. I have a number of websites uh, and I don't maintain them super well. Um, also, my Instagram, which is also just slowhandfarm, uh-huh. uh, is probably another good good spot. I'm, I'm actually uh, on that likely more than any other place. I'm on, uh, Slowhand Farm also has a spot on Facebook, but that's pretty much just Instagram feeding through uh-huh. and other things. And then, of course, there's websites for Cully Neighborhood Farm. Um, There's a Farmhand Carts website, which may or may not be working at this point. And I've got uh, another website, joshvolk.com, where I've posted a bunch of stuff in the past, uh, but that hasn't been very active recently. Yeah, but there is some great information there. So guys, definitely encourage you to check that out. Now, again, the book that just came out, what was the name of that again so people can get that? Uh, The book that just came out, you know, actually... Whole Farm Management from Startup to Sustainability. And that comes out at the end of October and it's published by Story. So uh, Gary Stevenson, who's at the Center for Small Farms and Community Food Systems at Oregon State University, was the guy that put that together. 
and uh, he he did some of the writing, and uh, lots of members of the small farms team wrote different chapters in that. Very cool. And we'll have that all that information in the show notes, guys. So you can just go to thrivingfarmerpodcast.com and there will be all of that there as well as now over 40 other episodes. So yeah, lots of listening if you're new to our podcast, um, but we usually have a new episode coming out at least once a week. All right, Josh, thank you again so much for your time today. This has been a a fun conversation, um, you know, not just about, you know, some of the nuts and bolts, but also about the kind of the deeper thinking around just small farming in general. And we just, you know, urban farming as well. So that's always uh, been fun. Yeah, too much to talk about, but uh, really thanks a ton for having me on. I, I really appreciate the podcast and one of the things I listen to on my commute uh, back and forth to the farm. So, Oh, I'm going to put that on my website. Yeah, listen to by Josh Volk. <laughs> 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 All right, Josh, you have a great rest of your day. Thanks for being here. You too. So there you have it, another episode in the books. So I'd love if you would hop on over to iTunes and leave us a rating and a review. Those mean everything to us. We love to hear what you're thinking. If you have a podcast guest that you can